Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 127. Have you ever used code to help explain a topic? How can Python scripts be used to understand the intricacies of access control? This week on the show, Christopher Trudeau is here, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. Christopher talks about an article exploring the evolution of access control by re-implementing the concepts with Python scripts. The experiment moves across the various access forms, starting with control lists, roles, and attributes, ending with purpose-based access control. We also cover a post about how to create dangerous pickles. We discuss where malicious code can hide within the serialization process and decompiling code as an educational tool. We share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including building command line interfaces with argparse, HTML and CSS for Python developers, a Python packaging user survey, a visual tkinter GUI creator, a PyScript-based data visualization cookbook, and a project for writing functional test helpers in Django. This episode is sponsored by InfluxDB. InfluxDB time series platform is built to handle the massive volumes of time series data produced by sensors, apps, and systems. Are you building real-time applications? Check it out at influxdata.com. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher, welcome back. Matt, good to hear you. So... We were going to start with just a really tiny news thing. We I don't know if we actually said a release date or like about when we were thinking Python 3.11 was going to come out. It has moved a little bit. It turns out that there's been a lot of additional testing required. We actually mentioned that, hey, test your stuff. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I have an upcoming conversation with Pablo Galindo Salgado. It's going to be coming in the feed actually before the release of 3.11. Due to all that additional testing, they have had to make lots of little tiny bug fixes to kind of get things working properly. A new release candidate, Release Candidate 2, came out. I guess this announcement was on September 12th. And so I just want to make people aware of it. Please, again, test your stuff for it. Um, there's been, again, a lot of little changes under the hood, a lot kind of doing to like the faster Python project things that they're trying to do to speed stuff up has changed some functionality and it's really a good idea to test your code. I'll include a link to this release candidate. Uh, remember that to test pre-releases, you have to look for the <laughs> tag pre-release python.org if you're installing from there. And yeah, so that's our just a little news item. Uh, it looks like their planned new release date will be Monday, October 24th right now, as long as everything goes smoothly from here. And we'll, again, have lots of uh, stuff coming out that week. I wanted to start with articles this week and start with one that's kind of an interesting one. It's by Philip Iscani. He's a, one of our newer core team members at RealPython. He decided to tackle HTML and CSS for Python developers. Kind of one of these things that I wanted to get out of the way is just like, who is this for? I would argue that it's really, if you don't know the fundamentals of HTML and CSS, they're good to know. There's a handful of really interesting reasons and some actually brand new reasons. One of them would be this thing called PyScript that everybody's very interested in as a potential distribution method. It still uses like HTML tagging and a lot of the conventions there. And if you're not familiar with like kind of how that stuff is structured, this is a great way to learn the fundamentals or brush up on that terminology. And then he actually provides a bunch of really great resources that go further beyond these topics. One of the topics that that I got out of it that was really interesting was about image tags in the alternative text. And there's actually a site that talks about that specifically, like what 
what should you put in it? <laughs> and typical gotchas, like if you write image in it, it's actually going to say image, image twice in like a, in a reader, <laughs> which is kind of a strange thing. So you need to be aware of that. And so anyway, the, the tutorial takes you through, again, structuring a basic HTML file, kind of like the hello world of HTML. And then how to view and inspect your HTML, use those tools inside your browser, which is actually a really nice, good skill to have. Working with images and page links, how to then goes into CSS and styling CSS, formatting HTML with accessibility, keeping that stuff in mind. And then it has a, a nice little section at the end that involves tools that come with Python, kind of built-in Python tools that help you write or parse HTML code. And then a lot of links to take you further, links to other frameworks like Jinja, which is a templating tool uh, that you might have seen, especially if you use tools like Flask or Django. Uh, tools like Flask and Django that are big, you know, or big or small types of web frameworks that go further. Places to, you know, kind of tie in JavaScript and so forth. He also takes you through how you might programmatically write HTML by using Python, like building tables or the reverse, like parsing HTML with Python. And so, I, again, I think it's a great resource for someone or maybe someone on your team that isn't that familiar with some of the structural basics of it. And this is kind of one of the places when I got back into programming that I started. I wanted to make sure I at least understood kind of the basics of what's happening with it. And something I think that, Chris, you and I have discussed is just the changes in CSS and understanding just the fundamentals there. There's some really interesting in concepts with CSS that you should know about. Like you go to explore the developer tool inside of like a pane inside the browser, you can see a lot of these tools that are in there and how they kind of work he talks about like what a font stack is, which is really kind of neat and how the sort of fallback happens if that font isn't available on someone's system. The idea of using classes to kind of structure and have better flexibility. So there's a lot of really, you know, not only just like the fundamentals, but a lot of nice little best practices to get you going. I think Philip has provided a, a kind of a neat resource there. And again, if you're interested in learning something like PyScript, again, it's just, another sort of a tag that goes inside your HTML. And so it might be helpful to be familiar with some of the stuff happening there. Well, one of my favorite little built-ins that you almost never know is there is Python's got a web server built in. Yeah. Yeah, you can host something really quick. Run a, uh, run a web server. I, I use it with a couple of my uh, static websites. So I'll run the static generator and then just point it at the directory so that I can quickly check whether or not the last generation worked. Yeah. Which, you know, it's a dash M command. It's just a one-liner and it's there, which is, batteries are definitely included. Yeah. Yeah, I learned about it really late. <laughs> I think I was talking to Adam Johnson about uh, some documentation things in a way to sort of stand up the documentation if it's all HTML and be able to read it right there and have it, you know, kind of live by by using the built-in server, which really is kind of neat. So what do you got for us? What's your first article this week? So this is this is a little different. So most of what we cover is learning something new about Python, either like a new feature of the language or a technique or a library you should use. And this article's kind of different. It teaches you something that has nothing to do with Python, but it uses Python to explain it. So that's kind of an inversion from the kind of things we normally talk about. Yeah. The article is called The Evolution of Access Control Explained Through Python, and it's by Adam Bugia, I think is how you say it. Apologize, Adam, if I've got that wrong. The concept uh, the article is teaching is how a multi-user computer system determines who has access to what. Hmm. So generally, once you start adding more than one user to a system, you have to assume one of them is going to do something nefarious. And as an operating system designer, you have to start thinking about how to keep this under control. So Adam's article talks about three different access control mechanisms. Uh, the first is called access control lists, which is shortened as ACLs. The second is role-based access, which is shortened as RBAC. And the last is attribute-based access, also known as ABAC. So 
The first piece of Python code shows some data classes defining the ideas of what you need to think about this. So there's a person who needs access, a record that's being accessed, and some sort of action that's being done, which is a read or a write. And what your access control system is supposed to do is decide whether or not a person should be allowed to form, perform the action that they want on a given record. So with that as sort of the background, he quickly sketches together a class called a system. And it's really just a wrapper around the operations. It's got a get and an update method. And then you pass in a person and a record, and it's essentially supposed to say, yes, this person can do what they're trying to do, or no, they're not supposed to do it. And so with that in place, you essentially have a framework to start talking about these things. Okay. So Adam sets up some tests and creates some people named Alice and Bob, which are good traditional crypto <laughs> and access control example yeah, names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then ha- add some medical records and actions that Alice and Bob can do to each of these records. So with all that set up, he then introduces the first kind of authorization, which, as I said, was ACL. Uh, these were first implemented in the Multics file system in 1965. That's even before my time. That's how far back we're going. And <laughs> if I remember my history correctly, the uh, Multics machine was made out of stegosaurus bones, I think. Anyways. Nice. Uh, Polished. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, high, highly processed stegosaurus bones. Uh, so uh, the there's different ways of implementing ACLs, but the heart of the matter is really just sort of a table that maps people's people to records and actions. So when Bob attempts to do something to Ben's record, the table is consulted. And if there's an entry for Bob's action, he's allowed. And if not, he's denied. And in the Python example, they do this by adding a access data structure to the records themselves. And so, uh, like I said, the, the neat thing about this article, although I'm learning something new about the history here, is you get this precision by seeing the actual Python code of how it would be implemented, which is far less wishy-washy than, say, the English language. The next step is to talk about the limitations of ACLs. You need a one-to-one mapping between people and records. And so you might want to, say, if you've got a lot of people, you might want to have groups of people. This department can do this rather than this person can do this. Yeah. And then second is the records are flat, which there's value in making them hierarchical. So if you can see this record, you can see all of the images that are attached to it, for example. Okay. So between those two concepts, you can start adding things like groups of people and hierarchies of hierarchies and all that kind of good stuff. So this allows you to do things like everyone at the company can see this drive, but only those in the IT office can see the settings folder. And that's just can't be done with regular ACLs. So this leads to role-based access or RBAC. And this adds a layer of abstraction. So I had a prof once who said the right answer to every problem in computer science is to add another layer of abstraction. And so this is, <laughs> this is essentially what's happening here. Sure. So that new layer is a role data class. So we add a role object that has a membership list and a permission list and a list of re- records to which the role applies. This added complication means you need to be able to reference your records, uh, and but most databases and file systems have sort of some sort of unique ID, so this isn't usually a leak, right? So you're, you're just essentially keeping a track of this role is attached to these IDs. So RBAC solves some of the limitations of ACLs, but for large systems, they can get pretty hairy. The example that Adam uses in in the article is Amazon's S3. There are over 240 possible actions allowed in that file system. So if you start trying to figure out how to capture all of that, that's a lot of permutations. So if Mr. Bailey and I are in the same department, but one of us needs one of those 243 actions to be different, all of a sudden the permutations explode and you end up with a whole bunch of different roles. Just finding them. <laughs> I, yes, yes, yeah. Well, and, and even in real systems that control all these, you're, you're often storing a lot of this information in things like LDAP servers and stuff like that. And, and it can be a beast trying to find the checkbox and does that does changing that checkbox do yeah. what you want. So yeah, they, these things can be a bit of a challenge. So the last one he talks about is uh, a higher level, which is another, another degree of abstraction here, which is the attribute-based access control or ABAC. And it takes some of the ideas of the RBAC and adds conditional testing. So the conditions are based on attributes of the person or the system or the record itself. 
So ABAC is a subset of a broader concept called policy-based access control. And this allows you to get crazy and define conditions like Alice is able to access anything created before 2003, but not after. Okay, like logic in there. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So the conditions can apply to the person, to the system, to the data, and they can also check things like what department is Alice in, because she's, you know, that's a property of Alice. What groups does she belong to? And then combine that with things like what actions are, is she attempting to perform and where is she attempting to perform them? For example, dev or production. So you might be allowed to do it in dev, but not allowed to do it in production. And the code essentially starts taking things that look like little truth conditions inside of Python and attaching that to the attributes and creating these little statements that allow you to determine on the fly true or false, is this allowed in or not allowed in. So Adam finishes up with a promise to write a follow-up article with even more detailed code at that next level, which is the policy-based access control system. So that's something to look forward to. But like I said, this was an interesting little educational thing with a little bit of history and a little bit of how operating systems think about access control. And because he's doing it with coded examples, it's it's very, very precise, very easy to understand if you've got enough background in Python to understand what he's doing. So right. it was, it's a neat idea, a neat approach, and I'd love to see it used across other topics. Yeah, that's kind of neat. And, and it gets back to like a really common theme for the whole discussion of Python is its readability yes. in a way, you know, like the white space kind of allows things to happen, but it also does include logic and things that allow that to be readable and, and definable and set, like you're saying. So that's cool. Well, and it's it's hard to know because I've been doing Python for so long, but I suspect somebody who wasn't well-versed in it would still be able to, because he's not doing anything particularly fancy. Right. It's pseudo code adjacent enough that I think even if your Python's not strong, you can get an idea of what he's doing, right? Yeah, definitely. That's neat. In the end, w- would you be able to use it as a, an authorization system? I, yeah, in theory, you could. The problem is you'd have to add... So all of the concepts are there in objects that he's creating on the fly. So at bare minimum, you'd have to add some sort of storage mechanism so that that idea of a record wasn't just something in memory. Yeah, okay. But but yeah, it, it, it would work. Time series data runs almost every technology, but building real-time apps in legacy databases can be a nightmare to manage. At Influx Data, creator of the time series data platform InfluxDB, they built their time series platform with tools so developers don't have to make wholesale changes to their product or application just to use InfluxDB. InfluxDB is optimized for developer productivity, so developers can build IoT, analytics, and cloud applications quickly and at scale. Check it out and start for free today at InfluxData.com. That's I-N-F-L-U-X-D-A-T-A dot com. So my next one is a topic that we've been kind of trying to hit on a a few times recently, and and you tossed this again toward me. And it's something that we've had some articles on RealPython, and I'll I'll include those resources also. But it's it's about pickles and uh, the pickle module or protocol that's part of Python. And it's Pickle Machine, which is interesting to think about. Very specifically, Evan Sangaline, who's writing on a blog for a company called Intoli, I-N-T-O-L-I, which they make an interesting set of tools, uh, these residential smart proxy things, um, which is kind of interesting if you're thinking about you know, web scraping and tools around that. It's it's an interesting stuff, but it's a little older. It's from 2017. So there's a little bit of a Python in it that might have changed a little bit. I didn't track down every single thing. There are some differences in the pickle module itself, but <laughs> the title of it is Dangerous Pickles, Malicious Python Serialization. The su- first subheading is like, what's so dangerous about pickles? And you might have heard this. Uh, in fact, if you've looked at any of the documentation around pickle, there's uh, some really blatant warnings like right away. Warning, colon, the pickle module is not secure against erroneous or maliciously constructed data. Never unpickled data received from an untrusted or unauthorized, authenticated source. It's sort of the same thing that you might hear today or even more a few years ago with uh, getting 
like Excel files or Word files that have code inside them. Macros. Yeah, macros and, and so forth inside of it that could potentially uh, run and, you know, get get messy inside your system or potentially, you know, maliciously infect other files in your system. Uh, one of the things that I think is not covered really well in this is kind of the uses of Pickle and why it might come up. And so might, maybe we'll talk a little bit at the end, but it's a serialization protocol. And I think the primary idea behind it is you have a set of data or you have a, a set of data and certain objects that you want to be able to save and potentially move from like one document to another or send to another user and so forth. And it maybe makes sense to serialize that or sort of, you know, gather it all up in, into one file that you can then send to somebody else and then they quote unquote unpickle it. And he's actually going about it in a very different way. And I think it's very sort of fascinating. Like, you know, I think of a, the article could be one man's quest to figure out how to use a pickle maliciously is <laughs> kind of like where I felt like this was going. He, he gets really deep into the idea of like, okay, what are the things that are happening in this process? He dives into using Python's disassemble uh, tool, the DIS which allows you to actually see the op codes and the, you know, underneath everything kind of see the language that's happening inside of the machine as it's actually processing this. And I've talked about this before with Brett Cannon and, and Ruve Learner, that this is kind of a neat tool to be able to sort of look at how your code is, is being sort of translated behind the scenes. And, he also mentioned some other tools that kind of can make it a little cleaner to, to kind of travel through. But he talks about opcodes, these like uh, global and creating different objects. You can kind of see the, these different steps that are in there where potentially a bad actor would try to place objects that could do something bad, sort of exploitable members of those opcodes. And along the way, he kind of, again, finds these different things. He, he mentions... Uh, PEP 307, which was from 2003, where it talks about in previous versions of Python, unpickling would actually do a safety check and on certain operations, refusing to actually call functions or constructors that would be marked as safe for unpickling by either. They note that it gave a false sense of security. Nobody has ever done the necessary extensive code audit to prove that unpickling untrusted pickles cannot invoke unwanted code. And in fact, bugs in Python 2.2 module make it easy to circumvent these security measures. But it's always been kind of an interesting little tool that's built into Python. Um, but the fact that it goes beyond something like JSON that's primarily taking data and can actually allow you to include like import statements of like importing OS and actually including executable code inside of it allows you to do these malicious things and for you to think about, okay, well, <laughs> do I want to trust this? You know, where am I going to unpickle this thing and, and make sure that it's okay? So it's really, it's a tutorial, if you will, for the type of person who likes to do white hat research, you know, to kind of find out like how to not let themselves get them into the situation and kind of how far things go. My suggestion, if you'd like to learn more about the format, is actually he references going into the docs really often. The Python docs on the Pickle module itself are really great. They've been updated quite a bit as he's gone. In fact, the warning's gotten even more terse and short. <laughs> warning, the Pickle module is not secure. Only unpickled data you trust. <laughs> so it's definitely gotten tighter in that sense. But it also the compares another serialization method and then how it would kind of compare to JSON. He actually was using these this other module, Pickle Tools, and those are tools for diving deeper into the Pickle format. Anyway, I was going to ask you, Chris, like, have you used the Pickle module and what were your reasons for using it? So I, I haven't used it in Python. I have used similar modules in other languages. Okay. Some of it is sort of historical. So if you go back 20 years, easy access to databases wasn't common. Oh, yeah. The kinds of things nowadays that you would just go, oh, use SQL Lite 3 and you'll be, and, and you'll have all this power. 
that wasn't there. And if you were going to use a database, someone had to go set it up on a server somewhere and you needed all this crap that, you know, user management and all this stuff that went with it. And often it meant an Oracle license, yeah. right? So that, that there was a complication to that kind of stuff. So you're able to save state in a way. It, exactly. So, so you need to be able to save state. So a lot of programming languages have mechanisms that are like this. And then the other common use was, again, and this is sort of predates a lot of the sort of web services space, is if you wanted to do distributed computing, oftentimes what you would have is you'd write yourself a little server that would listen on a port somewhere. Well, if that's in Python and you're in Python, then your client can talk to the server in Python and you can just, any of your objects on one side, you would pass them back and forth, which is what, you know, JavaScript and Node folks use JSON for, and uh, can, right, right. because you can, it's just basically the same, right? You can marshal it up, send it over, and unmarshal it again. So the pick, the intent, I believe, behind pickling is exactly this kind of stuff. It's a little dated. It's one of those tools you can kind of have in your back pocket that almost anything. There are some restrictions, but almost anything you can put in memory in your objects in Python, you can just write out to the disk and read them back again. Yeah. So if you're in that space where you're under full control of it and you don't have to worry about the security stuff, this might actually be a quick and easy way of handling something and not having to think about it. Yep. There, there'd be dragons. You just got to make sure you're, <laughs> yeah. you're wearing your fireproof underwear is what it comes down to, right? Yeah, we were using it for sort of data science stuff. Again, the idea that you've done processing maybe on your side and now you've kind of got all this data gathered together and instead of having to go through all those steps, and again, it's like it's already kind of there. And so you could kind of share the state of what the program was or potentially just reopen from kind of like a, it's almost like a save, you know, kind of yeah. an interesting way. And I would suspect somewhere between 80 and 90% of the uses of it can be just as easily replaced with a dictionary and load and save us in JSON and you're done. Yeah. Where it gets interesting is, you know, JSON doesn't support dates, for example. So if you're putting dates in, you have to convert them into strings. And if you want them back as an actual date object, you got to do that extra step inside of Python. Yeah. Whereas if you pickled it, it would just be date time, no It'd problem. Be, it's, it's Python stuff going in, could, Python yeah, stuff coming out. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it might save you a step in a few places. But like I said, there's added, added caveats that go with it. Um, don't see it as much anymore. But uh, yeah. You know, there's all sorts of stuff in Python that uh, are of value to people still out there, and uh, it's a, it's another tool in your tool belt. Yeah, yeah. And so again, I'll include a link, and we not only have a a good tutorial on the general uses of pickle and so forth, but also uh, a video course on it. So if somebody would like to dig a little deeper, this is really specifically this kind of weird white hat research of, you know, literally he calls it creating creating a bomb. <laughs> so. Which is kind of fun to to follow along and, and and see what you can do with some things sometimes. So we've had links to other articles on it as well in PyCoder, so we can include include some of those in the show notes if people want to dive in. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what's your next one? Uh, so this is uh, we're back to one of my courses. All right. It's a real Python course. Evidently, I've been busy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This one is called uh, Building Command Line Interfaces with ArcParse, and it's based on an article by David uh, Mastromatio. And ArcParse is a system library module for helping you define and use command lines, which is in your Python script. I kind of have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. Okay. If I haven't used it in a while, I always feel like it's a bit too complicated. And I'm like, how do I do that? How did I do that? But there are a lot of edge cases in, in command line switches, so it kind of has to be complicated. It kind of reminds me a bit of uh, regexes, not that it's anywhere near that difficult. But I know how to use it. I know I've used it before, but I tend to need the manual in front of me if I haven't done it in a while. Yeah. And I've, I've often end up with, like, I've got two or three programs where I've done some more complicated stuff with it, and I know I did it in there, so I just go and look at my old code kind of thing. So it's not one of those that I keep off the top of my head for whatever reason it doesn't want to sink in. Anyways, um, uh, tangent. So if you're writing a Python script, you can always get at whatever was passed in on the command line using the sysargv list. 
And if you just use that, though, you have a lot of coding ahead of you, potentially. So what arg parse does is let you define things like flags and arguments. So a flag would be something like dash v for version, yeah. whereas an argument might be, say, a file name that you want to pass in. So using arg parse, you define a parser, and then you call add argument on the parser, which defines a flag or a command line argument that you want to process. So look, look out for these things as you're going. Yeah, you can define as many of these as you like, and there are all sorts of things you can do to get fancy. But once you've defined all of them, then you call parse args, and it returns a parsed object, and you use that object to get at the arguments. So when you define an argument, for example, you name it, and in the result object, you reference that argument just by using that name, accessing it directly with a, a dot. Okay. So say you were writing a program that expected a number as an input, you could call add argument, name it something descriptive like num, and you could also tell it that it expects an integer, and then the resulting object that the parser returns would contain an attribute named num, and it would already be converted to an integer, because everything on the command line technically is a string, right? So there's that extra step, Yeah. and it does that for you. Okay. It also automatically creates help for your program. So if you didn't pass in that integer in that previous example that you needed, it would error out and tell the user, hey, you were supposed to give me an integer. And as part of that automatic help, it also generates a dash H flag, which will give you even more detailed information. So when you're calling the add argument method, you can give extra hints and text and explanations there. And our parse will give all that to your user if something goes wrong. So in modern Unix systems, you'll commonly find programs using flags with a short name like dash v and a long name like dash dash version. Uh, Arg parse supports this, allowing you to define multiple names for your flag. And uh, you can also declare whether or not a flag itself takes arguments. You can define how many arguments are expected, how many arguments are expected associated with a flag. Uh, you have control over the help messages aso associated with it and what to do when the user fails. So there's all sorts of depth here. And this is sort of why I said about the complication, right? Like that the, the one-off easy single flag is not too bad, but once you start getting into the depth of it, this, some of this configuration can get kind of complicated. Yeah, there's a lot there. As an example, one of the things it supports is something called a store action. And so for every argument you define, you can define what the store is. And the default store is just stick this in that parsing object. But there's something called store true, for example. And that will convert the presence or absence of a flag into a Boolean. So let's say you were uh, you wanted a flag called dash dash for both. Setting that as store true, when it's there, it would, you know, you'd, you'd print out more debug info. And if it isn't, it doesn't. So by converting it into the Boolean, it makes it easier for your code later on. So, and there's, I can't remember the exact number, but it's about a half dozen different kinds of store mechanisms and you can define your own if you really want to get crazy with it. So there's all sorts of depth there you can do with how your arguments are converted and how they're stored inside of that object. Like I said, there's a lot of depth here. I've only glanced over some of the key ideas. The course tries to cover most of the typical cases and uh, even includes one that's not in the article, which is subparsers. Uh, so that's where, you know, programs like Git, where you've got like Git commit and Git status, that second key tag, act, that action, whatever you want to call it, that's a sub parser. Uh, and arg parse allows you to build these kinds of interfaces complete with, say, flags and arguments for those sub commands. So, you know, the, the switch for status is going to be different than the switches that are available for commit and it allows you to build all that. So a lot, a lot of depth here. So if you do a lot of command line scripting, this is definitely one of those libraries you should know, or like I do at least know when to look up what you need to do and <laughs> sure. take, a, take a little recipe and do some copy and paste. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned a lot reviewing the course, getting into it. ArcParse is one of those nice built-in tools of Python, uh, which we will probably has been a theme today. <laughs> There's a lot built into Python, and it's kind of nice that it has something for, you know, kind of building these command line interfaces and at least making it a little easier for you to get going, though the, there is some pretty good complexity under the hood. And then there's a whole subset of additional tools that you could look at that kind of build on top of this functionality and give you other ways of, of approaching it. Yeah, and, and in fact, there's a lot of third-party libraries out there that make some of this easier for certain kinds of specialty cases, and the, the summary section in the course points you to two or three other libraries and why you might use them as well. 
This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It dives further into a topic we discussed this week. It's titled Serializing Objects with the Python Pickle Module. The course is based on a real Python article by David Mastro Mateo. And in the video course, instructor Joe Tatusco shows you what it means to serialize and deserialize an object, which modules you can use to serialize objects in Python, what are the types of objects that can be serialized with the Python pickle module, how to use the pickle module to serialize object hierarchies, and what are the risks when deserializing an object from an untrusted source. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how serialization works in Python and how, in the case of pickling, it can be used to serialize objects and help save or transfer state. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections and where needed, include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So that kind of takes us into our discussion this week. It's sort of a timely one because there's a kind of an ongoing survey that is ending the day that this comes out, but I thought we could at least talk about it a little bit. And then you had found uh, some conversation happening over there at Hacker News. So do you want to introduce this one? Sure. So uh, PyPI, which is the packaging folks for Python, has a new survey out. And like you mentioned, uh, it's active until the date of the release of the podcast. So if you're listening to this on release date, September 30th, uh, you can go and do the survey. And if not, go look at the conversation. You can see what's there. Hopefully the results come out soon. Yeah. The survey starts with some simple stuff like, you know, how long have you been using it? What, what, what packaging things are you using or not using? Uh, and then there's your typical sort of, you know, how do you feel about your cable provider kind of agree, disagree statements, <laughs> uh, you know, right, yeah. quality of Five the tools, levels. Yeah. Uh, how important they are to the language. Uh, then there's some sections about tools in other languages, which I thought was kind of smart. So they ask you, you know, do you use the equivalents in, say, Rust or uh, or Node or those? And if so, what do they do better than we do? And what should we change? So that there's, there's a lot of sort of depth to their questions. But our conversation isn't so much about the survey as the discussion on hacker news that this survey spawned. It, you know, it's it's um, it's always hard to separate the idea of packaging from distribution. Yeah, they're sort of siblings. And so as soon as you get on the internet and start talking anything having to do with PIP, you get some very strong opinions. And, uh, you know, and, and some of it, so, well, you should use Conda or, you know, Docker, all the things. And uh, right, so that you get a, a <laughs> yeah. whole bunch of the sort of uh, different approaches. Python's been around for a long time. And I think people sometimes forget that, particularly if you're new to the language. And uh, the reason I bring this up is because newer languages like Rust have a lot of this kind of stuff built in. And that's because older languages like Python and Perl didn't. And people have learned from that. And that's not to say that there aren't tools in Python, but what's happened is the tools are all sort of third-party libraries rather than being add-ons. And as soon as you do that, what ends up happening is you end up with five solutions. And that can be a good thing because, uh, you know, if one of those solutions doesn't work for you, you can go find one of the others. Yep. But it can also be a bad thing because, you know, if I come to you for help with poetry and your answer is use Conda, neither of us are happy, right? So. Right. Yeah, that's kind of one of these things that I think is kind of interesting with the whole conversation is I don't know if there's any spot to put some sort of fragmentation blame on things. It's like it's the the uses for Python are very wide and there's a lot of interesting tooling that's go been going on for years, which is hard to understand that stuff. And then there's like other environments that have decided that they want to create their, their own like entire set of tools and things like Conda and, and so forth. And so it, it, um, it's kind of hard to like even figure out like in some cases, the sort of best practices. And the problem that I see often is everybody just sort of throwing up their hands and just saying, it's also terrible when often my experience, like if I were to take the survey, which I, I started to do, you know, before we started today, I was like, I'm not having these problems, you know, I'm, I'm doing things that are very 
much centric, you know, just to me, and I'm not sharing my code as often. And I guess it really depends on your use cases. I was just thinking of the interview I had with Josh Burnett from last week, where, you know, he's got, I don't know, eight to 10 different packages up on PyPI. And I think it's just amazing that this mechanical engineer is not like a, you know, day-to-day software developer has been able to put stuff up there. And now one of his packages is so used that he actually got the 1% thing where he got notified. Right. And I think that's really cool, you know, like, to a certain extent, a lot of this is a symptom of success, right? Like yeah. there, there's lots of packages out there and I, at the heart of it too is an intractable problem, right? Dependency management, you know, if, if I if there's two libraries that I like and both of them are dependent on a third library and they want different versions, there's no answer to that. The best you can hope for is your tool says, by the way, you've got conflict here. So, and and that just, that problem multiplies the more libraries you're using and the more libraries those libraries are using the whole transitive dependencies thing, right? So, yes, could we have tooling that was a little better about catching some of this? And, you know, some of it as well is a, is a practices thing, right? So if, if, I, if I'm building a web project that's got, say, a half, a dozen uh, little libraries, and really all I've done is pip install two of them, but all those, you know, the transitive dependencies are there. If I want to start doing, if I want to make sure that I'm getting like the latest hotfix for a patch for something, I don't necessarily know how that's going to break something. Yeah. And, you know, in theory, if everyone's sticking with the dot version thing, you might be able to institute a rule that says, oh, we only go up by minor versions um, uh, without doing full regression tests. But in practice, uh, we can't even agree on how to use version numbers. So, you know, that that doesn't answer it either, right? That it's a it's a complicated system is what it comes down to yeah and some of it is supposed to have been addressed by the introduction of wheels which are a binary pre-compile of things we talked briefly about these with uh, when we were discussing the rough linter a couple weeks back yeah and you know because it's built in rust he had to do it all in wheels and that because he's done them in wheels it means you can pip install it and that's fantastic but the flip side of it is he's got 15 pre-compiled wheels. And if you happen to be on platform 16, <laughs> you're either compiling something or you can't use it, right? So yeah. so like, there's always edge cases here and there's always going to be people that aren't happy with something. Yeah. And, you know, everything's kind of moving also, kind of moving target. Yes. One of the things that they mention often here is the, you know, Apple kind of messing things up a little bit by changing their architecture from, you know, Intel based stuff to their own M series chips. And, you know, that's bitten me. I've definitely had that problem. I wanted, you know, it was like a few weeks back where I wanted to play around with this particular tool that was very data science based and use like specific versions of PyTorch and all these other kinds of things. And I just, I could not get it to work with my Apple M1 because of just these interesting versions that are there. And I need to realize that, you know, that's going to happen on a new platform from time to time until things kind of catch up in a way. And I don't know if that's settled down in some ways, but it it definitely makes uh, things tougher. And I, I agree that like a common refrain is, well, okay, just take a lot of that out of the way and use something like Docker and I do see larger, you know, kind of these big projects having the ability to kind of just create this whole sort of containerized thing that you can kind of rebuild and and you get rid of a lot of that. It's, well, right. it works on my machine kind of thing with that in some ways. So I accept you end up with the other problem, which is it doesn't work on my machine because it's five, year old, five years old and will not run your little whale. Okay. Yeah, that's true, too. You're, you're, there's an assumption of processing power. Yes, okay, we'll virtualize all the things. Okay, yep. Yeah. And uh, and unless you got 12 cores, I'm exaggerating yeah. a little bit, but... Yeah, to yeah. your point. I, well, I, one of the comments that uh, w- that I saw that I liked was, uh, that I thought was interesting, and I'm not sure how I feel about it, whether I agree with it, but it was an interesting comment, was, that, uh, was just the idea that Linux systems tend to have fewer problems than Mac or Windows because packaging is a first-class citizen in most of the Linux systems. And there is an argument there that if you've got that, you don't have to worry about some of this stuff. And the flip side of it is, now it's been a while since I've been spending a lot of time on Linux, but 
I seem to remember being stuck in packaging hell there as well, where you know I'd, I'd, I'd run app get or I'd run an RPM, and the next thing I know, I'd overwritten something I didn't intend to. Yeah, uh, you know, so. I, I think it's uh, one of those things that there's definitely uh, systems that do it better than other systems and languages that do it better than other languages. But I don't know that I've ever seen one where I went, yes, that's that's the right way. That's the way it should be done. I don't know that there's an answer. So part of that, you're discussing the tools on, say, Windows and Mac might be sort of, I don't know, I don't want to call them system level, but like these additional things that allow to be built like things like homebrew and chocolatey that we've mentioned on windows recently a bunch um that kind of give you some of that functionality that is built into linux with apt or what have you yeah but again they're they're second class citizens because they're not shipped by the operating system provider right whereas uh, many of the linux systems like an install essentially is let me put in a tiny little kernel and then I'll just go off and app get the world, right? So even their installations are built on top of that same mechanism. So yeah. there, there's a, a different degree of quality there. But, you know, Brew does a decent job, but I, every once in a while I run into, oh, yeah. wait, the permissions on that file aren't correct. And do I want it to touch that? I'm not sure. I've <laughs> I've spent more time on Stack Overflow debugging yes. Brew issues than Python issues I think ever... Uh, at least in the last two years, which is kind of interesting. Like I, I spend more time, you know, in other sites and other resources, um, kind of building things as opposed to troubleshooting things. Um, but homebrew, that's the one that always gets me back in there. <laughs> so, but that's also me changing my computer too. So, hey, and and just the one other comment that I saw, just to sort of bring things full circle back to you know, I was talking about the symptoms of success. Is if you stop and step back for a moment and think about how seldom you need all these other libraries in Python. Like one of Python's strengths in comparison to other languages is the fact that the standard library is huge. Yeah, yeah. And so although we do have this challenge and uh, it's something people are actively working to, to solve, right? you know, there's an awful lot you can accomplish without it. Uh, and I can't say the same about some of the other languages that are out there, right? Like, I, I can't imagine trying to accomplish certain things in JavaScript without, you know, going off to NPM or, or doing something else. Whereas si- frequently I can do Python plus Django is enough for me to solve almost everything I need to do, right? So Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I mean, we've mentioned it, I don't know, four or five times today, just the, you know, the, all the built-in stuff, which is nice. And yes... There have been, you know, we've also mentioned on the show the idea of different different ways people have looked at trying to make it smaller to be able to to accomplish things like PyDide and and PyScript and then also Circuit Python and so forth. These different places where the footprint could be smaller and maybe you know maybe you don't need all the built-in stuff, but in a, lo- a lot of cases, it's really handy to have on there. So yeah, I think packaging is going to be an issue for a while, and it's nice that they're reaching out, trying to get information, you know, trying to figure out how people are using it, trying to improve. I mean, that's one of the things I always see about the Python community and the people that are in charge of these different projects that they want to know what you think. And and I don't know if that's across the board and and lots of other communities in the same way, but like I, I feel like there are people trying to figure out additional solutions to it. So as much as <laughs> it may feel sometimes negative walking across a Hacker News article sometimes, I think there's at least people you know trying to at least figure out, okay, well, where, where can we make this easier? And I, I know people like Brett Cannon, he's been working really hard to try to make packaging simpler and, and more standardized. But that's hard, you know, especially like you said, with the age and how far it spread. So, well, the, the flip side of it is, you know, I've been at it since I can't remember either two five or two six. We've come a long way, <laughs> right? So, yeah, uh, sometimes a little bit of perspective is is good, right? Like we're we're much further ahead than we are, yeah, uh, than we were, right? So, some some of it is just taking some time. Yeah, well, I think that takes us into projects and. I actually am going to mention two of them that I don't really have a whole ton to say about them, more about just, hey, these are kind of interesting and I'd like you to check them out. One, I could find hardly any information about. It looks like it's by a Chinese developer based upon 
some of the stuff that I'm seeing inside of it, but the website is just visualtk.com. And the idea is it's a visual Python T Kinter GUI creator. And so you can just drag and drop elements from kind of a sidebar core widgets as he's labeled them, or they, I guess I should say, have labeled them. Things like labels, buttons, checkboxes, radio buttons, and the idea of like maybe building a form or something you would want inside of Tkinter to reuse. And then once you've laid out the visual things and maybe you've uh, renamed them and kind of got everything kind of organized how you want, there's a tab where it shows you the Tkinter code to create that. So you could just select all of that and then move it or export it and bring it into your your code. So I, I think it's an interesting tool. I, I think it could maybe teach you a little bit about messing around with Tkinter uh, and, and kind of getting a little further. It's pretty verbose, the text that's being created there. I think there might be ways to kind of maybe simplify some of it, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting tool. And the one that's sort of associated with it this week that I also saw is from Dylan Castillo, and he created a Python data viz cookbook. I found his tweet that he announced it, and he's actually kind of playing around with PyScript. And that's how he's created this thing. The idea is you have like a little REPL thing on the left side with the Python code, and then there's a drop down menu where you can say, what kind of graph do you want? And do you want a box plot, a bar chart, a donut chart, and so forth, a line chart, a pie chart, what have you. And then four selection boxes for different libraries that it would build them in. So it could be building it in pandas, uh, using kind of its flavor of matplotlib, actual matplotlib, uh, seaborn, and then plotly express. You can just hit a little play run button there on the bottom and you can see what the output looks like. You could, I think, go inside there and start adding little things in there if you wanted to, like retitle stuff and so forth. But it's it's pretty slick. It's a, a neat project that he's created here. And I think for somebody doing data visualizations, if you wanted to kind of a, a quick leg up on how to kind of get things going and also kind of a fun PyScript project. So thanks, Dylan. I think this is a, a cool project you've built here. And I'm intrigued to see uh, some of your further experiments because it sounds like that's something you're kind of focusing on right now. What's your project? So I'm starting with something called Django Funk Test. Uh, the library was originally developed for an online clothing store called Wolf and Badger, which I'd never heard of. Yeah. And the uh, creators are Luke Plant and Frankie Robertson. And uh, by the way they set up the credits, it seems to me like they're probably subcontractors. And they said they convinced Wolf and Badger that they should be able to open source this project and thanked them for doing this. Uh, so I suspect this is something they built out of necessity while dealing with a, uh, building a website for the client. So as you might guess from the name, the library is a set of utilities to help you write functional unit tests for your Django project. Oh, uh, okay. So give me a first a little bit of background. Uh, so if you're not a Django person, like most frameworks, it has a concept of what's called a view and a root. And a root is responsible for mapping the URL that you type in a browser into a piece of code, and the view is that piece of code. So a view directly or indirectly, and it can get complicated, but we'll keep it simple, returns what you end up seeing in the browser. So some HTML or some JSON or whatever you're showing. Automated testing on the web can be painful because you end up having to mimic what the user does. So Django gives you a short circuit method and within its testing framework that allows you to call the view directly, bypassing the routing process. So this means you can treat the view more like a function. So Django's testing framework returns from this a response object, and that includes the actual HTML and some context information and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that allows you to validate your pages without your web browser. So the limitation to this, and actually the advantage of it, is the page never gets rendered. There's no browser involved. So why it's a limitation is if the error is something to do with the cosmetic aspect of the page, or you're using fancy schmancy JavaScript, then these tests won't touch that. Mm, okay. So if you actually want to render something, you have to use a different set of tools. And one of the most popular is something called Selenium, and it acts as a click robot, mimicking what the actual user does on the page. Sure. 
And you can use this with Django, but you have to run Django in a whole other mode for these kinds of tests. And it essentially sets up the development server so that Selenium can, you know, play back the clicks and go through the actual web pages. And it's complicated because Selenium itself is a toolkit based on toolkits. So you have to have a another program running that connects Selenium to Chrome or Firefox so that it can talk to the actual browser. It, that's the background. And, and if now you're thinking, wow, is there an easier way? Well, this is where this is how we got here. <laughs> so Django Funk Test is a toolkit that tries to help with this. So the first thing they do, which I thought was very clever, is the, the kinds of tests that I just described, usually you have to write them completely independent of each other. And the way you write one is not how you write the other. Uh, what this library does first is gives you common calls that work in either case. Okay. So this is handy just in itself because Selenium tests tend to take a while because you're actually having to mimic what's happening on the page. And sometimes you want to say, just do a quick smoke test and Selenium might be overkill for that. And if your CI CD pipeline is running on a server and it's headless, you may not be able to easily use the browser. There's ways around that, but those are also painful. So having the same set of tests run in two modes with or without Selenium is a big win. It basically reduces the amount of code tests that you have to write in half. So right there, there's, there's some advantage to this. And then the second thing is Selenium can be a bit painful to write tests for. So you're often doing things like search for this tag in the page, change its value, wait for that to update on the page, and then you've got asynchronous stuff going on, which, as you've probably heard me scream about before on this podcast, sure. is messy. Try not to do it. Yeah. So Funk Test provides a bunch of methods like get URL, fill form, submit form, that wrap all of this stuff. And essentially, you're doing in one or two lines of code what would be five to 10 lines of code before, and they're worrying about all the asynchronous stuff for you. Nice. So so there's a lot of neat things in here, and they provide some other tools as well. So context-aware assertions, pushing the back button in the browser, figuring out you know what page am I on, where's the current URL, things that you can do otherwise, but normally you would do by hand and would require multiple calls or just built into this library. So I haven't yet used it in a project. I've just sort of played with it. So I can't speak for its robustness, but I'm pretty confident. I'm thinking back to the project I finished in June or July. I suspect this library would have cut my test code in at least half, if not better than that. So the next time I'm up to have to do some Selenium, I am definitely going to be in yeah. uh, playing with this, and uh, it could make a big difference. I'm just looking at the GitHub of it, and like they're on it, man. It's like updates yeah. two days ago. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, I can't, you know fully endorse them because i haven't played with it in a real world situation sure, yet yeah. uh, but there's a lot of potential here and it, it would definitely be uh, even even if it's a little uh creaky in a couple of places the advantages of uh the, the the far less code you have to write would be worth it and if it's not creaky even better yeah cool well thanks for bringing all these articles and projects to me again this week and so we can discuss them always a pleasure all right talk to you soon cheers And don't forget, InfluxDB time series platform is available in the cloud, on-premises or locally. Get started for free today at influxdata.com. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.